Hello, my wonderful super students. I wanted to record this brief lecture about using the Ohio State Library System to find resources for your paper. We will certainly talk in class about some other resources, and I apologize in advance. It looks like my cat is determined to meow throughout the whole video, so you might hear her in the background. There she is. Hi, Button. So first, let's start at the library.osu.edu website. You'll see me flashing back to this article quite a bit to help show you where I am in my tutorial. So the library homepage, library.osu.edu, links you to many useful resources for your paper. I want to emphasize that especially in English 110, but for a lot of undergraduate research, you do not necessarily need to read long, complicated books. You will need some articles written by academics, and those are generally 20 to 35 pages in length, so they're quite long on their own, but they're a lot shorter than reading a 300-page book. And I want to talk quite a bit today about how you would track down an article, which is often much more precise and clear than the longer book. So first, let's just get a feel for what's here on the library homepage. A lot of students are very quick to put their cursor here and just start typing something into the search box. Don't! There are lots of other ways to get around this page that are useful. In particular, you'll see a link here on the right to the research databases list. We'll be spending some time here today. There's also a link directly to online journals, so if you know the name of the academic journal where the article you're interested in was published, you can just cut right to the chase, skip a database, and go right to online versions of the journals and possibly get a PDF version right on your screen. There are also subject guides, so if you're researching a particular academic subject, you might be able to find it here. For example, food or agricultural or environmental sciences, maybe I'm doing a paper on animal sciences, and you can see the library has already set up these wonderful guides where you can find some sources that make a lot of sense for that particular topic area. So if you know that your paper fits neatly into a discipline, this might be a cool resource to explore. However, let's just assume that you're kind of poking around, you're doing a general English 110 paper, and you want to get started. My strong recommendation would be to start with the Research Databases List link, which I'll link into now, and to search for a very general database called Academic Search Complete. This is a database that covers a wide range of academic subjects, so we can use it for a very wide range of English 110 papers to get started. For a lot of you, this is the only database you'll need. So you'll see what I've done is I've typed the name Academic Search Complete into this Find a Database link, and I'm going to press Find in a moment. However, I want to point out there are also databases arranged by subject on this list too. So again, if you know that your paper fits quite neatly, or that you're looking for a source that fits quite neatly into an academic area, you might try these lists as well. For example, I'll take you for a moment into the politics and political science list, just kind of chosen at random, and you'll notice there are 36 databases listed under politics and political science, and each of them have their own description. Do read the description. So for example, if my paper is not about Arab-Israeli relations between 1917 and 1970, this is not the database for me. Similarly, let's see, how about if we go down to um, current digest of the post-Soviet press online. This paper, this is probably only a useful database if I'm um, able to read Russian, for example, because apparently everything in it is into, oh wait, it's translated into English, hooray. But if my paper is not about the post-Soviet era in Russia, I probably don't need this database. So again, you want to use your common sense, you want to be a flexible researcher, and read carefully whenever you're looking at a new database. So again, I've backed up here to just the research databases screen, and I'm going to search Academic Search Complete, to find this database. You'll see it brings up this link, and I'll go ahead and click on this link. And for today's demonstration, I've chosen to work with um, Cody's paper. Cody is writing about steroids in baseball, and he's looking for a source related to how psychology plays into steroids in baseball. So let's see what happens when we type in those three keywords and press search. The search screen brings up a mere seven results. And remember, I'm primarily interested in these research databases and finding a peer-reviewed scholarly source. Now look at this. Academic Search Complete has an entire search refiner just for that. So I'm going to click this little box, Academic Journal slash peer-reviewed, and click Update, which will maximize my odds of getting a scholarly source for my paper. And look what happened. All of a sudden, I only have one result. And look, I could click on this link, PDF full text, and I would be able to access this paper. Now, this is not exactly what Cody was looking for as far as I know. He's not looking for college student perceptions of athletes who cheat the role of performance in history, but I would encourage you to be a little bit flexible. Remember, good researchers are flexible. This still seems well within the boundaries 
of the research question. It's not an exact answer to the research question, but of course we're never going to find a source that exactly answers the research question. So I am going to take a minute to click on PDF full text and see what this article is really all about. So see my browser is downloading it. It's going to open in just a moment. And here it is. When you enter a research article, I want to talk briefly about what you would do once you get here. It can be a little overwhelming to approach an article of this length. You'll notice this one is 17 pages in length, and this is pretty dense prose. So one place that you might go immediately after you've evaluated the title is to evaluate the abstract section. These are usually short one or two paragraph sections early in the article, and they are designed for academics who are in a hurry to get the gist or the general summary of what the article is about. So if I were Cody, for example, I would spend some time reading this abstract so that I knew a little bit more about what was going on in this article, and I could make an informed decision about whether I wanted to spend the time to really start reading this article. Now let's say Cody has done that, and he thinks this article really has a lot of relevance. For example, I'm interested in this sentence for his research, that participants in this study revealed that they had more negative attitudes toward players with prior history of steroid use. That's pretty relevant to his research about um, steroid use in baseball. So how would I find that in this long article? Well, certainly you could start by reading the introduction, right? The first few pages will lay out the article. That's very useful. Another approach you can take is simply to look at the headers, right? To look at things like sports and cheating, prevalence of cheating, perceptions of others who cheat, and find a section that seems to make a lot of sense for your research. You'll see now that I'm actually scrolling to the bottom of the article because in many academic articles there's a section near the bottom called discussion that kind of wraps up and says how the analysis came out. And it really does the same sort of work that you're doing in your English 110 papers. Discussion sections are wonderful sections to find the kind of information that you're looking for and to start using the analysis techniques that we discuss in class. Now let's say I really liked this article and I wanted to save it for my research. I personally like to have a special folder on my computer where I can click File, Save As, and I can have a place just for my research project. For example, I'm saving here on my desktop, and I think I will make a new folder called My English 110 Research Project that will make sure that this article doesn't get lost. You'll also notice that the databases often assign random numbers in the name of your downloaded file. I'm going to name it a little more logically after the author's name, Joshua Feinberg, Feinberg Joshua, and College Athletes Cheat. That way I can remember when I look at the file name kind of what this article is about. And I'm also going to mark it article. Save. Boom. Now before I leave this article, I'm going to go back to the database and I'm going to look for one more thing which is I want to make sure that later on, when I'm ready to cite this source for my paper, it will be easy for me to make my work cited list. So a lot of my students like to keep what I call a dump list, a dump document, where they've simply opened a word processing file, and they are keeping a running list of every source that they are considering for their paper. Now eventually, some sources won't make the cut. It's a little bit like American Idol, right? As you examine some sources more closely, they're not going to seem as useful to you. But if you had this citation information already, you won't have to scramble to track it down later. And it's easiest to do it when you've got things like this that are telling you exactly where it came from. So I'm just going, ahead and, going to go ahead and use my copy feature in my browser to copy that text about this baseball source and just paste it right into my dump document. I can worry about the formatting later, of course, but this is all the information that I'm going to need for my citation. So, now that I've taken care of that business, let's talk about what happens if you're not as lucky as Cody has been. You'll notice that on our first attempt in Academic Search Complete, we typed in these keywords and bam, we got exactly the article that we wanted. That's actually sort of unusual. In fact, I wouldn't even consider it ideal to have only one result to choose from. So what this says to me is that I've made my keywords too narrow. There's too many of them and they're too specific for me to get the results that I need. So I'm going to look at my three choices, steroids, baseball, psychology, and think about Cody's research question. And I think really any source about steroids and psychology could really help out his paper. So why don't I try searching those more general terms and see if I get better results this time. Oh, see this time I have the opposite problem. The database has returned 1,009 results, and I don't know about you, 
but I don't have that kind of time or energy to wade through 1009 results. So what I'm going to do is maybe I'll make it a little more specific with something like, um, let's see, steroid psychology sports, right? That's not as specific as baseball, but it's also smaller than just steroids and psychology. So let's see how I do when I hit this middle ground. Ah, look at that, 60 results, all from academic peer-reviewed journals. So now I have a good working total. I feel pretty confident that I can wade through 60 results. And really conveniently, Academic Search Complete tries to search these articles by relevance. So you'll see a little bar down here that tells you how relevant the article is. This one has very high relevancy. And then I can simply use the names and the keywords that are attached to decide if they're relevant to Cody's paper. So for example, a systematic review of diagnosis and medical treatment of mental illness in athletes. Well, this particular paper that Cody's writing is not really about mental illness. So I probably wouldn't spend time on this article. This one's about body image and female bodybuilders. That's not really what Cody's writing about either. This is the article that we found before in our more specific search. So we've already looked at that. And I would keep on going until I found an article on this list that I thought might have some relevance. For example, I'm interested in this article for Cody's research question, exploring the social image of anabolic steroid users through motivation, sports personship orientations, and aggression. This seems pretty close to his research question, and I would spend some time looking at this. So again, one of the things I would do is I would copy and paste this information into my research source dump document over here, and I would also try to download the full text of the article. In this case, they have the PDF full text. Now let's talk about examples where you find that they don't have the PDF full text right in this database. You'll notice this little Find It button. I want to highlight it for you at the bottom of each article. The Find It button does exactly what you think it does. It attempts to find this same article in one of the library's other research databases. So I'm going to go ahead and click Find It. And you'll see that the library system was able to locate the full text of this article in another database called the Electronic Journal Col Collection. Now, I will warn you, sometimes you click on this link and it doesn't work. <laughs> okay, this time it worked, but it did. Sometimes it doesn't. So let's talk about how I might find this article in other ways if I hit that train wreck situation where this page tells me, sorry, just kidding, I can't find you the full text. Well, one way that I could go back and find it is to go back to my library homepage at library.osu.edu, and now that I have the information about where this source comes from, I can find it manually, right? I can try to find the Scandinavian Journal of Medicine, Medicine and Science in Sports from April 2009. I know exactly the volume and issue number. I even know what page it's on. So I'm going to keep this window open. In a separate tab, I'm going to go to the online journals list by clicking here. And I'm going to see what happens when I just type in Scandinavian. Title begins with, and I'll double check the name, Scandinavian Journal of Medicine. There it is, okay, in the online journal list. Apparently this is in two different databases. I could actually find it in the Electronic Journal Center, or I could find it in Sport Discus. So I could click into the EJC, as we call it, and I can keep referencing back to my database. I'm looking for 2009, volume 19, issue two. Okay, right, I'm gonna drive the water buffalo a little bit here. I'll cruise down to 2009, issue two, there it is. And then once I get this far, I can actually get to exactly the article that I want based on the page number. And there it is. So again, don't be quick to give up. If you really think this article might have potential, you wanna really track it down. Now there's a couple other things I want to talk to you about today. If Academic Search Complete and the other databases don't necessarily um, yield the results that you want, you can use one article to find other articles. So for example, if you found one that you really think would work, you might actually have found a treasure trove of many potentially good articles. So let me pull up one of the ones that I was just looking at for Cody's paper. I was looking at this one from, let me see, Oh yes, this is that Scandinavian Journal of Medical Sciences that we were just playing around with. Okay, this is the actual article. Now the same advice applies. I would look at the abstract, right, the general summary to get a feel for whether this article was useful. I would start reading the introduction, right, 
Although it's pretty dense, you'll find that you can usually understand the gist or the general ideas that are being discussed. I might also skip down toward the bottom looking for sections called discussion or concluding sections. So you can see here we have a section called discussion, and I would certainly look at that as well. And finally, there's a concluding section. Now watch this cool trick. Okay, I'm going to go up to the introduction, and let's say I'm reading along, and I find a sentence like this that seems really relevant to the research question of my study, like, in this case, I'll zoom in so you can see it, the goal of the current investigation is precisely to address the issue of the social image of drug users among fellow athletes focusing specifically on sport motivation, sports personship orientations, otherwise referred to as fair play or game spirit, and athletic aggression. Now do you guys see this? Butcher and Schneider, 2001. So this means there's another source written by someone named Butcher and someone named Schneider from 2001 that's about exactly this. Cool, right? How do I find that? Well, I'm going to let this researcher, who's done me a favor by telling me where this source is, lead me to it. I'm going to go to their references list, and I'm going to look under Butcher, and look what I find. They tell me exactly where it is. Okay, here's their author names, and then here's the name of the article, Fair Play as Respect for the Game, and it's in, um, it looks like it's in a book edited by these people called Ethics in Sport. It's published in 2001. Look, they even tell us what pages this is on. How nice are they, right? So let's do this, okay? Let's go try and find this book, Ethics in Sport, by um, Morgan, Meyer, and Schneider. Again, I'm going to go back to the library homepage, and this time I'm going to look for a book. Now watch how I do this, guys. Did I just click into here and start typing something? No, I'm not going to do that. I'm going to click more specifically on books and more because I'm looking for a book, right? I'm going to type in the name of the book that I'm looking for, Ethics in Sport. It happens to be a title, so I'm going to be as specific as possible with the library system so that it will find me as close to what I want as possible. And look what pops up when we do that. Ethics in Sport, I click on that. There it is. Morgan, Klaus, and Meyer. Meyer and Schneider, 2001. It's available in Thompson Library. And there's two ways I can get it. I can either request this item and they'll bring it to the front desk, or I could just go to the sixth floor of Thompson Library and pull it right off the shelf. Now, guys, let's talk about this other situation. Okay, sometimes these books are checked out and every copy is checked out. And I think students are really quick to click on request this item, even when it's checked out. The way that our library system works, if you do that, you're going to be waiting a very long time for this book to be returned by the person who's got it checked out. So, let's just say I wanted this book, okay, and let's pretend for a minute that it was checked out from the library. Instead of saying request this item, I would click on this big blue shiny Ohio Link button. Ohio Link is a system of interlibrary loan that hooks our library up to other libraries from all around Ohio. So if there's an available copy in another library, like the University of Toledo, Ohio Link will get us that copy, and it's a lot faster than recalling the book from our library system. Ohio Link will take anywhere from three to five business days to bring you the book. If you use the Request This Item button on a checked out book, it could take as long as three to four weeks, and you don't have three to four weeks. So what I'll do is I'll just display holdings of Ohio Link libraries so that you guys can see. Look at how many copies of this book are available in lots of other libraries from all around the state, like Bowling Green, Cleveland State, etc. When you click Request on the Ohio Link page, Ohio Link will automatically calculate the closest university that has that book, and they'll try to pull from that university so that you'll minimize the time it takes for transport. Now notice I told them that I'm in Ohio State. I give them my name and my university ID, which is right on your buck ID. I'm going to say that I want it at Thompson Library. Now, I don't really want this book, so I'm not going to click Submit. But if I did, this would go into the system, and I would get an alert by email from the library system when the book was ready. How cool is that? So, let's see what else we need to talk about. Let's say you actually have to go into an academic book, okay, right, like we talked about. We just talked about ethics and sport, and our wonderful friends here from this article told us exactly what pages we needed to read, right, 21 to 48. That's a luxury because we won't have to read the whole book. But what if you find that you're in a situation where you have to go in an academic book and you don't know where to start in the book? 
there's two places that I would recommend. One is the table of contents. I'm sure you're all familiar with using a table of contents to, find, to look in an academic book. Another place that you can go in many academic books is to go into the final pages of the introduction chapter where it's conventional in almost all academic fields to describe how the book will proceed and what will be in the various sections. So let me show you that in one of the books that I've read recently. This book is called Standing on the Shoulders of Giants by Rebecca Moore Howard. It's very long, right? I think it's somewhere in the neighborhood of 300 pages, right? Here's the name. I happen to have an e-copy from the library. And you'll see that the table of contents is not particularly helpful in helping me understand what's in these various sections. So instead of trying to just guess whether what I want is in anxieties of authorship and pedagogy or down here in modern authors, I'm going to go into the introduction chapter of this book, okay? And I'm going to go to the end of this chapter. Okay, so here's the introduction, right, like I promised, and I'm going to scroll and find the end of it. Like there's chapter one. Let's go back to the end of this introduction, and I bet you dollars to donuts, the end of this introduction tells me exactly how this book proceeds. Oh, there it is, okay? I'm going to zoom in for you. Look, part one argues that the term plagiarism, blah, 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 right? And Rebecca Moore Howard tells me exactly what she's going to talk about in part one. And then on the next page she says part two does blah, 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 blah. And she's really clear about what happens in part two. This will happen for you too. And in a lot of academic books they even say exactly what each chapter is about. So again, that will direct you to the parts of the book that will be most useful to your research. Another way to play this game as an undergraduate is to remember that in academia, most academics publish an article before the book. In fact, they can't even get a deal to write and publish the book until most of them write an article about it. So one way to do this is to say, why would I read a 300-page book when I could just go and find a 35-page article? So I could try and track down the article. And let me briefly show you how I would do that. I'll go back to the library system homepage. And this time, instead of just typing anything, I'm going to click on articles above the world catch search. And I'm going to search for this author's name from the book. Okay, let's say I'm trying to avoid reading Rebecca Moore Howard's Standing on the Shoulders of Giants which was published in 1999. I might search Howard Rebecca Moore. And then sometimes since I'm off campus, it's going to ask you to sign in. Don't panic, right? And then you'll notice I get a lot of results and I've only restricted myself to peer-reviewed articles. That's good. I want to look for an article that predates the book. Okay, the book was written in 1999, so it can't be this. That's from 2001, right? Well, look at this, 1995, just a few years before she publishes that book, Standing on the Shoulders of Giants, she publishes Plagiarism, Authorships, and the Academic Death Penalty. Ooh, that sounds like a killer article, huh? All right, so I click into this link, and it's going to try and look for a copy for me. And look, they have a copy online in JSTOR. And I can just pull it up right here, and boom. Suddenly, I'm looking at the article which is much shorter. Look at that. It's not even um, like 20 pages long, and it's going to cover a lot of the same ground as the larger book. So that would be my recommendation. Now, whenever you're in a research database, you want to look not only for a chance to download a permanent copy like this view PDF feature so that I can stick it in my handy dandy little folder that I showed you where I'm downloading and keeping all of my wonderful research, but you also want to look for chances to view the citation. Because remember, for your dump document with all of the citations, you want as much information as possible. But check this out, right? A lot of these databases will just give you the information that you need. And again, you can organize it later. You can just go put it in your dump document. And later on, you can worry about all this fancy formatting stuff, right? But you've got the information you need in case you use that source. Finally, last thing for today, I want to briefly talk about how you can manage citations when we get a little more into that. Both, what do I do if I am looking at a citation that I don't totally understand, like um, the one that we saw with Butcher and Schneider. Let's have a minute to look at that. For example, let's say I'm looking at this article, and I don't know quite how to read something like this. I don't know what this means. Well, I can use the date, right, the emphasis on the early date to say that must be APA format. That's different than the one we're using in class. And you'll notice on Carmen that I've linked you to the Purdue OWL 
It's the online writing lab. They have a wonderful reference section about APA, and they show sample citations of all kinds of APA citations. So you could go into this and compare your citation to what you see in this and then figure out what kind of source it is that way. And so for example, if it looks just like this citation for a book, you'll know it's a book. In this class, we're going to use MLA format. Again, MLA, the Modern Language Association, which is more common in the humanities disciplines. We'll talk a little bit more about this on, during Tuesday's class, but I wanted you to see this because, again, you might run into an MLA-style citation and you won't know quite what to make of it. So this would be a good place to go. Finally, I want to point you to easybib.com. This is a little bit like a calculator to let you figure out how to cite um, any kind of website or other source that you find in MLA. You can simply fill out this chart and it will create a citation for you in MLA format. How cool is that, right, to make things easier for you? I don't have any problem with students using things like EasyBib or even proprietary paid software like RefWorks. I don't think you need to buy software for this class. I think resources like EasyBib and the online Purdue Owl will more than carry you through but I want you to know that I'm comfortable if you decide to use something like RefWorks. Finally, let's say all else has failed, you cannot find what you need, you're freaking out, and you can't find me either, right? Maybe it's not office hours and I'm not answering your email. The librarians are wonderful people who really genuinely enjoy helping the undergraduates. So you can call them using this phone number, you can email them and they really do answer their email, or you can even chat with them online during most hours. So please don't hesitate to contact the librarians if you're running into trouble or you have questions. So that's a quick introduction to our library system here at The Ohio State University. I hope you enjoyed it, and uh, let's get researching.